Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to the next uh, episode in Conversations. This is a special one. This is Conversations about the Quran. And I'm extremely grateful to Professor Joseph Lombard, who has uh, decided to talk to me about his fantastic contribution that he and his team, under the guidance of Sayyid Hussein Nasr, put together the study Quran. We will talk a lot more about this in a minute. But first, let me also thank the Islamic Community Center in Lancaster, who are very supportive of this series. Uh, professor Joseph Lombard is an associate professor uh, in, in Qatar. He teaches in uh, the Quranic Studies Department of the College of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University. He is a translator and a commentator uh, and a general editor in the study Quran. He is both Muttarjim and Mufassir al Quran, and he will remain so for the rest of history. Even when his obituary is written, it will say that he was a commentator and a translator of the Quran, mashallah. He received a PhD and MPhil in Islamic studies from Yale University, an MA in religious studies, and a BA from George Washington University. He also studied in the Muslim world, in Morocco, in Egypt, in Yemen, and Iran. Uh, and he has been teaching courses in the area of Islamic studies, Sufism, mysticism, and obviously Quranic studies. So, so without much ado, welcome to Conversations, Professor Joseph Lombard. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I must say that this is perhaps one of the most important events in my intellectual life. Uh, this has made my life so easy, whether I'm doing research or whether I'm planning to give a khutbah or give a lecture. In fact, I'm teaching a small class on the Quran uh, for my family members, my brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews. And tomorrow I'm talking about Surah Fatiha. So I went and read a commentary on Surah Fatiha. Uh, it was interesting. I had forgotten about the hadith about four things that scared shaitan and you, your reference to it. And I will start with that. So, and, and the kids will hopefully get engaged. So to me, this is a, one of the most important uh, working tools in my toolbox as a scholar and as a Muslim intellectual and as a practicing Muslim. So in that sense, I think this is one of the most important things that has happened. But I also think that it is, it is a turning point in Islamic studies in the West and in America. We now have a commentary on the Quran, a translation and a commentary on the Quran, which can be placed on the same shelf as the classics. So it deserves to be in the same bookshelf as Tabari and Fakhuddin al-Razi and Ibn Qasir and Qushayri's Lataif, etc. So that is an important thing, and it kind of uh, says that uh, the Muslim community in the West, especially in America, the Islamic intellectual community and scholars are coming of age that they are producing work that is of great quality. So congratulations. Uh, I want to say a little bit more about it. This is a commentary that relies on 41 classical commentaries. Uh, it has 15 essays in it. Uh, it's over 2,000 words, and it is clearly written uh, with an eye to assist both academics as well as practitioners of the faith uh, who are uh, speaking on these issues frequently. It is unapologetic about anything, and what is also interesting is that it has been written very well, and I commend you and your partners about it. So without much ado, let me start off with my first question. And uh, I want to start with, with that hadith. Uh, and if, if you are familiar with the hadith, uh, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you always hear about it all the time, uh, where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Khairukum man ta'allam al-Quran wa allamahu. Those who study the Quran and teach it are indeed the best amongst you. And what is interesting is that the title of your book is in that hadith the study Quran, and I found that very interesting. Those who study Quran and teach it are truly blessed. So having said all that, let me ask you the first question. Is this a commentary or is this an interpretation of the Quran? I got a little confused whether it is a tafsir or sometimes people use the word taliq, you know, to comment well, on. You know, it's, it's different. 
difficult to say. I mean, the, one of the things that you, that, you know, we would say, I would say that it doesn't fit into the mold of tafsir in the classical tradition. Because usually when you find a tafsir, a tafsir is coming from within a particular school of thought. And part of the goal in penning that tafsir is uh, to kind of provide a kind of intellectual girding for the uh, scaffolding of that particular school of thought. And the way that we have gone about it with the study Quran, we're, that's not our intention. Our intention is to provide a, uh, a broad scope of what have been some of the predominant interpretations of the Quran over time, in addition to, uh, to showing how the Quran is uh, interlinked with other parts of it and what the actual kind of uh, real you know, direct language of the Quran often implies, which sometimes you're surprised is actually not um, as uh, readily available in tafsirs as one would want. You know, even Abu Hayyan al-Ghanati uh, took his fellow um, mufassirs, commentators, to task for what he thought where they were obscuring the, um, the clear meaning of the Qur'an um, with uh, the expectations of, um, of creedal readings of it. So by not doing that, we're not in the classical mold. That's why some people have called it ta'liqat, that is like notes uh, on the Qur'an. Um, but really, at the same time, one has to look and see that the definition of tafsir has really never, never been settled upon. People are always saying that take like, for example, you know, a Tha'labi. A Tha'labi's tafsir was a very influential tafsir for several um, centuries at the time that it was written. It was well known, it was studied by the scholars. And then there came to be a time when people tossed it aside and people wrote very nasty things about his tafsir. Um, and then, uh, and it wasn't studied for many, many years. One couldn't find a printed edition of it just 30 years ago. Um, whereas you find the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, when it first came out, it wasn't that widely read or that widely cited or used. And for many centuries it wasn't. But then with the interest of uh, certain groups within uh, within contemporary Islam in Ibn Kathir's tafsir, it has now become the most widespread, so widespread that I sometimes have to say to my students, yes, but Ibn Kathir is not God, um, when they <laughs> ask me about, you know, how, well, but Ibn Kathir says this, I said, yeah, well, what does the Quran say? Um, so, uh, you know, and we go back, we go into Sufi tafsir. There's Sufi tafsir that people say, that's not tafsir. Well, okay. And people will say, well, Shia tafsir, that's not tafsir. Or Shiites might say, yeah, Sunni tafsir is not tafsir. So what is tafsir? Well, it's a huge, you know, sprawling collection of approaches to the Quran. It goes beyond a genre. Um, and when you look at tafsir that way, you could say that, um, that when people are looking back on history, they'll put the study Quran in that category. Who knows? I have a few questions which are methodological in nature. And my first question is a question you're asked often is about the sources. So when I saw the list of the 41 tafasis that you have primarily relied upon, when I looked at the list, I said, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. And then this particular argument, uh, I, mean, I even heard Sayyid Hussain Nasser talk about it in one of the events as to how there was a conscious attempt made to exclude modernist and uh, reformist uh, contemporary tafasirs, uh, especially people like Maududi and Qutb uh, and others. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that you gave was that uh, many of these people simply rehash Ibn Kasir and Tabari usually. Uh, so I understand that there is very little new, but this idea that let's exclude modern commentators in order to present a classical understanding of the Quran. It occurred to me that if your study Quran was around when you were doing this project, you would have excluded it too, right? Uh, I guess you would say we would have, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but one of the, the, the real issue there is that um, for, this, for the first study Quran to come out, it has to be something that is providing those dimensions of the tradition that have had staying power. And oftentimes when one starts to interact with contemporary material, one starts to fall into 
a kind of a myopic view conditioned by presentism um, and where people are actually using some of these verses in ways that we might be more familiar with. You know, so for example, some of the um, political uh, interpretations that you'll find with Said Qutb, for example. And those are things that, um, for, for one thing, we want to avoid falling into that trap ourselves. But another thing is, is we really don't know what the state of some of these tafsirs will be in 100 years, 150 years. And it might just be that the time that we live in um, makes us uh, think more readily about those interpretations. Whereas we can safely say that the, the time that we live in is not what makes us turn to Shaukhan. It's not what makes us turn to Al-Alusi. It's not what makes us turn to al uh, And so those are tafsirs that have really stood the test of time, that have been influential in uh, various phases of the Muslim community over the centuries. And uh, those seemed to be the most reliable way to go about constructing such a text. I recently looked at some South Asian commentaries of, uh, of the Quran, and I had this very strange experience that I'm reading comment, commentary on verse after verse, and I find that in each comment, there is qualitative difference. The first two or three paragraphs seems to be of reasonably high quality, and the next two are extremely polit political and ideological and, mm. and polemical rather than instructive or academic or educational. And then it took me some time and then I realized that the, 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 the paragraphs that I was liking were essentially either summaries of Tabari or summaries of Ibn Kathir. So, so even in the contemporary tafsirs that you see, uh, uh, the, 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 the heart of the tafsirs relies on the classical scholars. So, so I understand that, that, I mean, they are inescapable, so to speak. Uh, uh, I have two more methodological questions to you. So, so for example, the Quran says that there are two kinds of verses in the Quran, those that are metaphorical and those there are perhaps clear or legalistic, mutashabihat, uh, you know, and those which are mahkum. So when you were going about writing the commentaries and translations, do you, do you ever ask yourself, is this a metaphorical ayah and therefore we should approach it differently? Well, you know, that's an interesting issue because there's not even really full agreement on what that particular verse, the one you're ver referring to, verse 7 of Surat Al-Imran, yeah. um, there's not even full agreement as to what is meant there by Mutashah Bihat. And, uh, and so, uh, on the one hand, I mean, you know, one wants to be cautious of that. But um, on the other hand, it was because we were doing a study text, we had to deal with all of, uh, of the particular verses um, that were there. And you know, some people say it only refers to um, those, uh, those verses um, that have the, the letters at the beginning of 27 surahs, like Alif Lan Mi, Alif Lan Ro, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then you know, others say it's particular things. And some people say, well, it's, it's muhkam if you understand it. Okay. And it's Mutashabih if you are one of the people for whom the meaning is a little bit more difficult to grasp. That's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, you know, there is also this idea of abrogation, which you all touch upon it in various, when, when you point out that, that, for example, when you were talking about uh, 262, you point to the fact that according to reports from Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, 385 is supposedly abrogated that verse. So there is no divine list of which verses are abrogated and which are not. And even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not tell us, well, here's this list. Some are pretty obvious uh, that you can just look at the, the two verses and realize that, yes, these are abrogating verses. However, uh, uh, the, there is a political side to, to the way the theory of abrogation is used. So did you guys, when you were uh, doing your commentaries, did you have a position on abrogation so that when you encountered claims that this verse is abrogated or that, you decided to engage with it rather than just report? Oh, I mean, you know, um, in that, we kind of followed the way that many other commentators have. You know, for example, Al-Qurtubi. 
uh, will often mention that some people say that this is abrogated, but uh, other opinions say that it's not. We even have at the time of Tabari that he says that, you know, for example, you gave the example of 262. Um, uh, it's a, a Tabari or a Tabarsi, I can't remember which one specifically says that this cannot actually be abrogated because it's a promise from Allah yes, it was Tabari and who said that, yeah. What's that? It was Tabari who, who was actually Tabari ends his commentary Tabari. by saying this is a promise of God and it cannot be abrogated. A promise and it's also a khabar, a khabar, a report from God cannot be, uh, cannot be abrogated. So, you know, these, uh, these things, there's the, what, which verses are abrogated and which are not um, is not something that there's full agreement on. You have some lists where you would have, you know, 17 verses that have been abrogated. You have others where you would have over 200. Yeah. And, um, and there was a period of time in which the vast majority of ulama agreed that the sword verse, verse 9, 5, uh, verse 5 of, of uh, Surah Tawbah abrogated many, uh, many of the verses. But then there's another question is, what is even meant? And, and the Qurtubi also brings this up in his tafsir. He says, you know, people understand abrogation, nasq, differently today than they used to. He says that it's more like, like it limits the meaning of a verse, not that it completely eliminates yeah. the particular interpretation uh, of that verse. Uh, and you, you find nuggets like this throughout the tafsir when they end up acknowledge that some of these issues are uh, not so hard and fast, a little bit more problematic than they're, uh, than they're sometimes made out to be. And I would say that, that Nusk abrogation is a very difficult topic that a lot of people um, need to be very careful when they talk about it, because when they say such and such abrogates such and such, what they mean is that such and such a scholar is of the opinion that yes. such and such abrogates such and such. And, uh, and even if they find they can say that such and such abrogates, they say the majority of scholars are of the position that this abrogates. That's what you're saying when you're saying that one verse abrogates another. And that's a very important distinction that a lot of people um, don't uh, make when they start to get into this particular discussion. Yeah, it, it makes me very nervous when uh, hubbers about the opinions of the companions are sometimes reported as hadith, for example. According to hadith, even though they may be part of hadith collection, uh, we cannot pretend that this is something that the Prophet, peace be upon him, has at least said. Uh, one other question about this is sometimes you do refer to scholars uh, beyond the commentaries, like Faisal al-Tafriq by al-Ghazali, I've noticed he cited a couple of times. So on some critical issues, and that would be a judgment from your perspective, what are critical or controversial issues? Uh, did you feel the need to go outside the tafsirs and look at scholars who are specifically focused on just that aspect of the Quran or that particular ayah in order to include them in your commentary? Or did you consciously try to limit your commentary to be sourced only by commentaries? Well, um, we wanted it to be mostly sourced by commentaries, but sometimes you know, the, the commentaries don't provide you everything. I mean, you could take just for example, if you're going to be following the classical commentary, sometimes they also were taking materials from other materials outside of the tafsir tradition and using them in how they interpret it. Sometimes you find it and it's not cited. Um, and so we were very conscious. I mean, I'd say that there are several places, for example, where I draw from the Futuhat al makiya of, of Ibn Arabi. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yes, there are places where I draw from the Ihya as well. Part of that also has to do with having background uh, in some of those texts. Um, and, uh, and the fact that at times there are certain places where the uh, tafsir tradition, you, I mean, I remember there are certain verses where you're looking through, you're looking through, you're looking through, and you're, I have now consulted 30 different tafsirs, and I don't think anybody's getting this verse. So what do you do at that point? Um, because there is a point where one after another, what is said, when you read through commentators, I mean, there are days when commentators were basically like other human beings and they went through particular passages and they just kind of passed them over. People have written before and they don't add anything new. 
Um, and then all of a sudden you find nuggets and gems where they really deeply engage um, a particular set of verses. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's the same set of verses where there's a particular set interpretation that you find given in one way or another in almost all of the classical tafsir. And sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, you're like, why weren't people engaging this on a deeper level? And so you do look at times, you, you, you are kind of forced to see if you can find other ways in which these verses have been engaged outside of the tafsir tradition. You know, when I started looking at the facets of the Quran, uh, obviously I turned to the tafsirs to understand things that I was not understanding. And uh, I, was a, I was, one of the things that struck me is, the confidence with which some of these scholars in the past have approached the Quran and, and think, oh, well, now that I have understood it, well, let me explain it to you. And uh, even though they do provide that, oh, there are alternative uh, uh, explanations and others have also looked at it this way, uh, ultimately it is their own interpretation which follows through. And the best of the tafsirs are one where you can actually get the voice of the, the commentator itself. That's why Ibn Kasir is so popular because he has a very clear, distinct voice that appeals to certain segments uh, of the Muslim community. Uh, but did you also, I mean, did you have to grapple with your humility in order to be able to speak about the speech of God and say, okay, I understood this, now let me explain this to you? I mean, one always has to, you know, uh, grapple with that, but uh, to be quite frank, um, I never thought that I was, um, you know, I would basically say after having done this, I've, I've never thought that I have somehow grasped the word of God. If anything, in going through all of these different tefasir, I've become, uh, you know, ever more awed at the polyvalent nature of the Quran and how these seemingly simple words open up to so many different levels of, of meaning. refracted in different intellects and different hearts in these different ways. If we were to do a word <laughs> cloud, you know what a word cloud is, right? So, yeah. So if this was digitized and then we would just run the word, if you did a word cloud of uh, all the commentators you referred to, which would be the biggest name out there? You know, um, for each person who worked on the study Quran, each section, that would probably be different. Oh, so interesting. So for example, I would say if you were to go through Jener Dale's sections, that it would definitely be Fakhar Dino Nazi. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to go through Maria Daykakes, I'm not sure actually, I, I wouldn't be able to say, but probably if you were to take the whole of the study Quran, it'd probably be a Tabari. Yes. I, I thought so, but I mean, that will probably be the case with nearly every every major commentary in the world, right? That yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's set a baseline. It's, it, 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 in terms of how we conceptualize tafsir today, Tabari is the one who established that. And it, it reigns through to this day. In one of the issues with the, with the commentary, especially if you look at uh, the importance of Asbab al-Nuzul, uh, and uh, which is the, the 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 occasions when these verses were revealed. If you look at Wahidi, we have less than one thousand on record, and the rest of the the asbab are often derived from Tabari and others early commentators. But the hadiths which are reported in uh, in Mufassir, by Mufassirs in Tafsir literature. They, do they have the same degree of authenticity as those ahadis which are reported in Sitta Sahih? If, because uh, I don't think those, tra those traditions may have the same degree of authenticity, uh, yet we are employing them in understanding uh, God's words and the Quran. And, and, and because of the way we interpret those verses of the Quran, they will also have juridical implications by you know, people who are then using of seeds in order to give fatwas, etc. And while they may think that they are relying on authentic ahadiths to give their fatwas, the interpretation that they're taking from the Quran, they could be relying on ahadiths which may not have the same degree of vetting 
I'm not saying they are authentic or not. I'm saying the degree of vetting may not be just that as uh, robust as they are for the Sitta Sahih. Well, first, there's a few a few aspects of that question. When you start getting into fatwas, you know, usually when people are going to be giving a fatwa and they're going to be citing um, a hadith, they're going to be very much aware of the degree of authenticity of the hadith um, and in helping them, uh, you know, come to come to a judgment. And sometimes if they are citing one which is not considered fully sahih, it will be because they know that there isn't one that is better, that is better authenticated that they could be citing in that particular instance. But the broader question here that gets to the Esbab and Nuzul um, is that, yeah, the Esbab and Nuzul is, is, is a problem. And the way that it's been used is a problem. You know, even Ibn Ashur, in the introduction to his tafsir, he addresses this issue, saying that many people have misunderstood how to use um, the Esbab and Nuzul. Even when you have Sahih Esbab and Nuzul, um, sometimes you know, there are at least five different ways in which you use those. Sometimes they're absolutely necessary for unpacking the meaning of a verse. Without the, uh, without the asbab, we would not know what a particular verse meant. That's very rare, um, but there are a few instances like that. For example, the, the instances of, of Surat al-Mujadila, um, when, when a woman comes and complains to the Prophet of how she's being treated uh, because her husband committed zihar, uh, we would have no idea what this meant if we didn't actually have the Asbab and Azul to explain it to us. But then you have other instances when a particular person was in a particular situation and a verse was revealed regarding that, that person's situation. And it doesn't change the meaning of the verse, but it illuminates the context of the verse. This is why I actually think that this Asbab and Azul, it's better to translate it as contexts of revelation because that's more what is meant. So rather um, than causes, you mean? Was that yeah? Rather than causes, because causes is also theologically problematical yeah. because it implies that a contingent historical event forced the hand of God mm -hmm. to bring down a particular uh, revelation. Whereas what what the way that we understand this is that these are contexts in which these particular verses were revealed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Um, so, you know, even when you go to Al-Wahidi's uh, Asbab and Nuzul, many of those um, uh, hadith are not sahih. Uh, and you'll even find in Al-Wahidi, you'll find some Asbab that, um, for example, with Surat Al-Adiyat, that don't really match with one another. So you're not sure which ones uh, to take. Um, I mean, this is actually something I've, I've been thinking of doing a, um, a, a YouTube video or something on this. Um, because there's a lot of confusion that people have when, when they hear, you know, a spab that if, for example, this verse was revealed regarding, you know, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, all right, so now that means it refers, no, it doesn't just refer to him, it refers to people who do the thing that he did in that particular situation, and he is now here an example of that. Um, so, uh, that, that's, that's, there's not just the question of which ones are sahih, there's also the question of how you work with the Esbab and Azul effectively. And different people work with it in, in different ways. And even, you know, even Ashur, 20th century commentator, he felt that there was a need for a lot of clarifications with this. Like every verse has this quality of being a categorical imperative, right? Like it has a, a principle in it which is universal and probably timeless. So one of the things that Asbab would do is to delimit it in, by contextualizing it and saying that, okay, this, this happened because of these circumstances and therefore perhaps it is applicable only in this case or in these kinds of circumstances. So the second case would be instructive. The first case I think would, be, would not be very helpful, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are instances when, when you do need the Asbab to understand, you know, what would be the type of situation in which one would act um, upon a particular commandment uh, given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, um, but, you know, that is actually the minority uh, of the cases of, uh, of Asbab and Uzul. You know, I, I remember, I, I give your 
the study for on to a lot of students and to imams and friends also. So I remember giving it to a grad student and I told her, I told her, treat it. This is one of the best examples of uh, literature review that I can share with you. So in that sense, um, uh, when as believers, as Muslims, we approach the study of Quran, we think of it as another tafsir among tafsirs, right? Uh, however, it is slightly different in the sense that uh, you, you, and you have said this elsewhere, that you have included opinions in it which uh, you find repugnant yourself, uh, perhaps, and yet you have included it because it exists in the tradition and uh, commented it in the past, have included it, and you would like to, uh, to point out to readers that look, Muslims have understood this in many different ways. Uh, so in that sense, it is, it is a, a more of a literature review rather than a, a personal voice or judgment. However, in the case of 548, uh, I found that there was an argumentative tone which was very distinct from the other commentaries uh, I read there. And I found that you were determined, and I think it was you who who commented on that. No, I didn't. I didn't. Well, it was not you. Oh, so that's interesting, uh, because when I was reading it, I said, "Oh, this. I think this is Joseph." But anyway, no, no, there Maria, was an. They take wrote the commentary on Surat Al Maida. Oh, so I found that it was very interesting to see that she was argumentative about it. It was very clear that she wanted the the pluralistic meaning of that verse to stand out. Uh, uh, you know, especially with the Shirat Anwa Min Hajam, that different that God has given different laws and different ways to different communities, uh, which may be valid uh, even today. So, so to me, that was very interesting. In fact, it also inspired some of your critiques to accuse you of having a pluralistic bias across uh, the entire commentary. And by pluralistic, they did not mean that you included many voices because they were upset that you included many voices but uh, the, the religious pluralism side of it. Well, I mean, I don't, uh, I mean, this issue of, of pluralism, I mean, I'm not quite sure, you know, exactly, um, uh, exactly what you fully mean by that. Um, because in terms of there being multiple religions that, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed uh, over time, uh, this is, uh, very clear. I mean, this is part of, of the Quranic message that there is a single um, uh, there's a single kind of overall message. But I mean, this is one of the things where I actually found that um, some of these uh, reviews they actually took particular passages of the study Quran uh, completely out of context. Yeah. You know, so you know, for example, when um, I think it was in um, uh, a commentary on 4171 and 572 that um, one reviewer said that uh, Maria Daycake was trying to provide a woeful justification of Orthodox and Catholic uh, Trinitarianism. Um, but actually, what yeah. happened is that, uh, is, is, I hope you don't mind, I'll, I'll read what actually Maria Daycake um, uh, wrote there, is that she wrote that some could read it this way, but then she says, whereas the previous verse criticizes belief in the divinity of Jesus, this verse criticizes the form of doctrine in which God is one of three separate entities to be worshipped. Some commentators understood the Christian Trinity criticized here to compromise God, Jesus, and the Mother Mary as three distinct deities. And she goes on and makes it clear that uh, that what she's the only thing that she's saying is that the Trinity, as technically defined within Trinitarian theology, is not specifically addressed within the Quran. And this is a, a, something that Fakhreddin Razi himself said, whereas people didn't even take the time to read what she had said carefully and accused her of saying, and it's like saying, it's like if I, if I were to say, well, some people claim that you don't need to, I don't know, fast the month of Ramadan uh, if you're a believing Muslim. However, it is clear according to all schools of law that you must fast Ramadan. 
And all you did was you took my quote that said, mm -hmm. uh, some people say you don't need to fast the month of Ramadan. And you said, this is what Joseph Lombard said. That's the type of criticism that we came up against when people were criticizing the study Quran. There were people to whom we actually tried to say, oh, you took this out of context when they were saying stuff on social media. And instead of engaging us and going back yeah. to the passage, they just blocked us on social media. So these types of, of criticisms, a lot of them weren't actually engaging the text in full. You know, when, when I, I decided to talk to you about this book and I've been using it for, for more than three years now and I use it frequently. Um, there were times when I was giving khutbahs uh, every Juma all over the state and uh, I would, this would be my starting point for research. And so when I, for this interview, I had to spend more than 10, 15 hours, not only reading up the critiques, the reviews, etc. And it was very clear to me that except a couple of very good, like Mubin Waid's critique uh, was at least it, it was very apparent that he read a lot of it before he started, uh, you know. Up yes, Mubin Wade's, Mubin Wade's uh, critique was, was done, uh, was, was, I've constantly said to people, this is the way you do it. Yeah. It was done with adab, it was done with yeah. ilm. I yeah. don't agree with him, Yeah, but I still say he did a good job. Yeah, he did it. It was, and his own biases also came out very clearly in his review. And then, I, uh, and uh, Haddad also didn't do a bad job, uh, but he did take uh, cheap shots. Uh, uh, excuse I will me. Left. Haddad did a horrible job. <laughs> well, I, I will come to that him. I just, that I just went to, yeah. where he took something out of context. That was that was him. Yeah, I know that's that was one, him. That's one of several instances. Well, where was what taken I meant to say that. Some reviewers, it appeared to me, looked at it for maybe an hour or two and then commented on it. And then there were others who spent a lot of time on it. And I think Haddad did spend a lot of time on it, but he was hunting for targets to shoot. So, for example, when he accused you of uh, misinterpreting or accused the group of misinterpreting uh, the story of Sodom as the problem might be be only forcible sodomy and not uh, consensual homosexual actions. Uh, he does take a quote uh, uh, from, from one of the comments. And, and I was wondering uh, what your take was on that point, because the, it appeared to me that he wanted to use that critique to completely delegitimize de the entire project. Yeah, so he actually, that's another instance where what he did was he took a uh, he took a particular passage out of context, and um, I mean I, I can read the entire part that he he took a part out of context, and um, what he says is that um, sourcelessness is another way of purveying outlandish ideas such as the unreferenced speculation by some that the real crime of the people of Lot was forcible sodomy rather than consensual homosexual. Is this is an LGBTQ perspective. Um, actually, he leaves off the Q, but anyway, he says this is an LGBT perspective that has nothing to do with scholarship of any kind, let alone exegesis. All right. What yeah, actually it's on, happened there? It's on I'll page the 436. Passage. Yeah, I'll read the passage. Exactly. I'll read the passage from the study Quran. Forgive me here for reading a long time in this discussion, but here's the whole passage. All right. The indecency for which Lot chastises his people is that of men coming with desire unto men instead of women understood by the traditional commentators to revert to the practice of homosexuality and sodomy specifically, a practice that the verse indicates originated with the sodomites of Lot's time. One report indicates that the people of Sodom engaged in this practice only with those who were outsiders in their town, which is consistent with their having demanded access to the angels who had visited Lot, whom they clearly perceived as foreigners. Other commentators, however, suggest that the men of Sodom preferred sexual relations with men to relations with women on a regular basis. The aggressive behavior of the men of Sodom in the biblical account, as well as in 1177-79 and 1567-71, has led some to speculate that the real crime of the people of Lot was forcible sodomy rather than consensual homosexual relations. Although the emphasis in verse 81, as well as in parallel accounts, and they're listed there in the commentary, 
is explicitly on the act of men desiring men instead of women. The insolent and violent manner in which the men of Sodom sought to fulfill their desires is clearly implied in the account of Lot found in 1177-80. So what it's basically saying is that interpretation doesn't really mesh with how this is presented within the Quranic text. And if you go to other passages within the study Quran, where that particular issue comes up, that references, it mentions this, and it references back to this particular commentary, saying go to this part of the commentary to see how that issue is, is dealt with. I don't know how anybody could read that as us trying to say that that particular interpretation, that it's only forcible, is actually in accord with what the Quranic text says. One of the things I noticed from hostile Muslim criticism of the study of Quran and also friendly Muslim criticism. Uh, so for example, Hassan Shibli of Canada, I was watching his video. Uh, they try to push it into academia. They think this is good for academics, but it is not good for, for Muslims. Uh, Muslims should be careful about it. Mubin Wade is very clear in which he says basically, the, the tafsir does not uh, contribute to your faith and it is contrary to orthodox Sunni mainstream uh, aqidah essentially, that's what he's trying to say. Uh, so what is, the, what, are, what is it about uh, the study of Quran that they, they are frightened of? Uh, I mean, they're fearing some kind of misguidance now from this book. Is it the mm -hmm. content of the study of Quran or is it some of the things that people accuse uh, Dr. Sayyid Hussein Nasser, that uh, he, he could be Shia, he's a philosopher, he's a perennialist, uh, and therefore not exactly a model orthodox Muslim scholar, and therefore his work would, uh, would not meet uh, the stringent standards of orthodox Sunni Akhidah. Okay, well, that's hard to say. I mean, because you said they. So for each individual, I think it's something very different. Okay. Um, and, uh, and there are some people for whom it has been a very honest, my job as an alim is to support and maintain a particular aqidah for the community because this is what will keep them within the bounds of Islam and will pave the way to the akhirah for them. And this just has too many different ideas in it. And so it's not going to be beneficial for them in that regard. Um, and uh, so, yeah, alhamdulillah, I think that some people are sincere in, uh, in that approach. Um, unfortunately, I think that there is another group of people for whom um, this was really about um, feeling that their particular little area was being threatened. And a lot of people don't want anybody to regard um, other people as being scholars in this particular area, as being uh, those to, to whom other could look others could look for guidance uh, in this particular way. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, the, with each one of them, it's different. And different people have taken different approaches. Um, and some people uh, with whom I have great differences of opinion and different approaches have had great adab in, in how they've expressed these differences of opinion with me regarding um, the study Quran text. If you actually were to pick up the first printed edition and compare it to the last printed edition, you'll find that a lot of changes were made. Um, that you know, there were certain things that were uh, uh, places where consistency wasn't properly followed in the translation. There were places where something was slightly off in the commentary that has been corrected. And a lot of that has to do with interactions with other scholars. And, um, you know, and I've had, I've sat down at tables with scholars and had debates where basically we came out and we agreed that, well, we just don't agree on these particular matters, but we respect one another's training and background. And alhamdulillah, let's hope that what they do is of benefit for the community and that what we do is of benefit for the community. Is it safe to describe it as a Sufi leaning commentary? Well, you know, I mean, I don't know what one means by Sufi. Um, because, uh, you know, there are people who have some, there are some more extreme forms of Sufism. Um, and, um, and 
I, I mean, I don't want to name any of them, but that might not be it. However, there are certain things in the Quran that are, you mystical. know, that, well, I wouldn't say, I mean, we could say mystical, but that the focus of them is about Tazkiyat al-Qalb. And if you want to talk about ultimately what Sufism is, Sufism is the most widespread place in which you have uh, established methodologies for the purification of the heart. And, uh, and it is the practice and implementation of those methodologies that is the focus of Sufism. And in that respect, that's right. It's Sufi. All right. If, if, if that's my, and that's my understanding of Sufism, um, the most widespread science for the purification of the heart. Now, what will come through the purification of the heart is knowledge of the unseen. And so sometimes you have with Sufi tafsiris descriptions of things that one encounters in the unseen. That isn't necessarily something that everybody needs to hear in their tafsir. And so that's not something like, for example, the tafsir of al Kashani, which is known as the tafsir of Ibn Arabi, that's not cited a lot because there's not a lot you can actually do with it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things, for example, in the Haqqa'iq tafsir of Abdul Rahman al-Sulami that you just really can't use because it's coming from, it's almost like, like, like the particular vision that a person who has dedicated um, him or herself to the purification of the soul has had through the encounter with a particular verse. So that's not something that you could actually put in there. But in terms of, you know, how are you going to understand the heart? And how are you going to understand, you know, certain verses that are speaking about um, processes of purification? You need to go to Sufi Tafsirs for that. And you know, so, yeah, we have that. Speaking about the criticisms, I, I paid a lot of attention to, to, to the critiques and what they're trying to say. And I think that they, their fears are more about this imaginary negative uh, direction in which young Muslims might go if they approach it uninitiated. But I think one of the reasons why a lot of Muslims who, whose linguistic skills are limited to English perhaps are uh, uninitiated into the Quran is because there was no such commentary available to them. You know, I have like 20 different versions of Ibn Kasir, 10 volume, abridged, unabridged, two volumes, one volume, all free, by the way. Uh, and I, I lament the fact that I don't have an English translation of Fakhr al Razi or even Tabari uh, to, to some extent. Uh, or, and uh, if I had them, I would be using passages from it in my classes. So I think what you have done is that you have opened windows into the classical uh, tafsir literature. And if, even if people say that this is only limited to the, the classical age, fine, it's a great contribution. We now have access to the classical age. We also have, uh, uh, I think, opened the door to encourage other Muslim scholars to go ahead and do tafsir if someone is very strongly of the opinion that this is limited to, to, to classical and does not include modern, well, you're welcome to do a study Quran on modern tafsirs. You're open to study Quran on the perspectives of women on the Quran. And so I think people should take it positively and do that. To me, the greatest value is that it allows you to appreciate how Muslims have devoted their lifetimes and, and how much depth they have found in the Quran text. And you give us a glimpse of that. And to me, that is fantastic. So my question to you is, what next? You know, it's when Obama won the Nobel Prize so early on without doing anything, I kept wondering, what's he going to do a young man once he finishes his eight years? What is he going to do? Uh, so what do you do now in your rest of your intellectual life after having done something like this well you know it's it's interesting that that uh, that you say that i mean said hussein nasser said that this was the most important project he had ever worked on in uh, in his academic life yes um which is you know a lot coming from a person who gave the cadbury lectures and the gifford lectures i mean he's one of only three um uh, intellectuals in uh, who's given both the cadbury and the gifford lectures and been in the the um the uh library of living philosophers series um, those are all, you know, all together. That's a lot of accomplishments. But he said this was his most important project. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I'm actually doing now is I've moved to doing a podcast um, on uh, on the Quran, which is new, um, because I actually think that the um, podcast format um, lends itself uh, quite well 
uh, to doing an extended uh, tafsir over time that will come out and one that's very accessible. Um, one of the problems that we often have as scholars is that we conceptualize our discourse with other scholars as our interlocutors. And, uh, and we sometimes do not accept what a scholar has done that views non-scholars as the interlocutors as being scholarly and, uh, and academic. Whereas to really the skill of taking a lot of this information and distilling it in, uh, in a manner that, uh, that is still true to what other academics have written, but makes it accessible, that's actually, I think, sometimes far more difficult than writing an abstruse academic article that 12 people are going to read. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of the things that I want to do with, um, with this um, uh, series of Quran for All Seasons as a podcast. And uh, another thing is, you know, quite frankly, going in the more scholarly academic direction, we need to do an entire, you know, like 20, 30 volume uh, kind of, you know, like the, came, the, what is it, the Anchor Bible commentary. Yeah. We need to do something like that um, in, the, uh, in the English language. Um, I honestly don't know if we'll ever be able to do it because of some of the limitations of how academia is structured today and, more importantly, how um, inept uh, the Muslim community is in realizing how they need to get behind such projects in order to make sure that it is Muslim voices that are heard when we are speaking about our traditions and, uh, and our texts. You know, I, I read somewhere that uh, Hajar Asfalani, the one who wrote Fat al-Bari, the commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari in what, 70 volumes, apparently when it was published or printed or finished, there were celebrations in the city for one whole month. Inshallah. Um, in, in the city of Baghdad, they celebrated it for one month. There, there were parties for one month. And I was wondering whether you guys were given a party or not. So next time, inshallah, if I have an opportunity, I would love to host a party. I think the Muslim community needs to celebrate this. We got, no book is perfect other than the book of Allah. And any effort that is done, this is monumental. Uh, this is 50 years of work, right? Five of you working for 10 years. And I, I was looking- I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, you're kind of <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I looked at it and I realized that if I were to start this, if I had started it, it would probably take me 200 years to, to be able to do something like this. So it is a monumental work, undoubtedly. Uh, and it is also, uh, it, it, I hope it challenges other Muslim scholars to take up projects like this. Uh, and we really need uh, that level of scholarship. Increasingly, English is becoming the language of Islam uh, and Muslims worldwide, to the language through which we engage. And having uh, such quality work, I think, will only enrich Islamic studies. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I think, hopefully, the, your location may be able to, uh, for you to garner resources which will be able to provide uh, that 30 volume tafsir that you are seeking. Uh, Inshallah, and I hope and I, I pray that uh, you, you and your family are safe in this difficult period. And I'm extremely grateful for you to take time out and uh, talk to me about this. Uh, and uh, there's one, uh, uh, one request, or I don't know, shall we say, that, that uh, I heard Dr. Nasser saying that future editions may have uh, uh, the Arabic text of the Quran. You know, it's like saying there is no Quran in the study Quran, uh, in the absence of the the Arabic text. So, so I, I know it will lead to two volumes. The font sizes are also very small. I, I just discovered that I'm also getting old. Uh, I now have glasses. So I think that uh, a two volume edition with a slightly bigger font on the commentary part uh, and uh, and and the Arabic text. Uh, is something that I think the American Muslim community should be able to sponsor. Uh, it's, it, how, how much, how expensive can it be uh, if the community yeah. decides to subsidize it? And I think that I, I, I want to use this occasion to appeal uh, to, to the American Muslim community to invest in projects like this. Uh, it is, um, 
you know, some postmodernists consider books as monuments uh, of history. So when they try to do archaeology of history, they look at books as monuments. And I think that uh, uh, you and your team have indeed built a very beautiful monument uh, of Islamic civilization in the West. Congratulations to all of you. And thank you very much for talking to me, uh, Joseph Lombard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Professor Khan.